Thanks, Tim. It's always an honor to be here and share the stage at Cato with Bob and Clark, who were uh, fantastic uh, friends and co-counsel in uh, Heller. It could not have been done without their contributions. Um, ideally, the Second Amendment should function like a normal provision of the Bill of Rights. That was the goal of, of Heller. And I believe that we uh, may well be on the path to achieving that end. Uh, that would mean that from time to time, cases would arise uh, raising some novel application of the amendment to a new set of facts. And the courts would disappoint both sides with some regularity uh, as the right develops organically uh, into the future, indefinitely. We have yet to see, for example, uh, the one Fourth Amendment case that ends all search and seizure debate in America and resolves uh, uh, that part of the Constitution for all time. That's not going to happen with the Second Amendment, most likely. But the reality can, can be definitely less than ideal. At the present time, uh, the situation is decidedly mixed. Some courts take the Second Amendment very seriously, and they've applied it to secure meaningful positive change in people's lives that my clients and, and other people feel uh, every single day. Other courts, however, are profoundly hostile to the concept of the Second Amendment. They believe that Heller is not so much a legitimate opinion <clears throat> that must be followed as much as it is an obstacle, a puzzle to be solved, something to be bypassed or defeated. Uh, we do know from the outcome of the McDonald case that three of the President Justices on the Supreme Court, if given the chance, would vote to overrule Heller and shut down, I suppose, uh, this uh, type of debate and this event uh, uh, into the future. Uh, we don't yet know how Justice Kagan uh, feels about uh, Heller and McDonald, uh, but it is uh, fair to uh, wonder whether one or two different votes, uh, if the makeup of the court were to change in the near future, would alter the landscape very dramatically. Now, I didn't always feel this way when Heller was decided. Uh, I went on record and believed that even if the court were to become more hostile to the Second Amendment, uh, they wouldn't flat out overrule Heller. They would find creative ways to limit it or give it a narrow reading and otherwise make the right uh, ever less meaningful. But I think I've changed my mind on that. I think it's fairly obvious, not just from the McDonald dissents, but also looking at the attitude of some uh, of the lower courts that elections here matter, they matter greatly, and a, a small makeup uh, uh, in the Supreme Court uh, 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 could, uh, could definitely uh, influence this and, and put the, uh, the Second Amendment uh, uh, out of business. So uh, elections matter, and people should probably be concerned more as to uh, uh, where judges are coming from and how they feel about this and other constitutional rights. Now, I don't wish to overstate the case for despair, as our opponents sometimes do. Uh, it's always interesting to see that uh, Anti-gun groups will say, oh, there have been six or 800 or 900 cases uh, making Second Amendment arguments in the wake of Heller, and they've all lost, and therefore this is really quite a worthless uh, right. Well, let's remember that many of these cases are essentially frivolous cases. The prison inmate who files a habeas corpus petition alleging that he had the right uh, to uh, uh, use a gun in the commission of a bank robbery, uh, things of that nature, uh, I mean, it's, it's not fair to say that just because somebody makes an argument under constitutional provision, that, our, th that the loss of the argument necessarily means that the provision itself is not serious. The universe of uh, meaningful Second Amendment cases that really are going to make a difference one way or another is much, much smaller. Uh, before we get to those, of course, it's always important to note that even in some of these bad, uh, crazy cases, uh, we do get some interesting language. Then there have been many cases where uh, courts have looked at um, a challenge, often a criminal challenge, and they would force the government to put up its proof. Uh, cases where the outcome perhaps is never really much in doubt, but nonetheless courts would say to the government, look, you really do need to deal with this as a meaningful fundamental constitutional right, and uh, the case would be remanded for additional evidence where the government would be forced to make a, a better case than that which they initially were able to uh, prevail on. Additionally, some criminal cases, some of the, the less uh, interesting or worthwhile cases will generate language that says, yes, in your situation, Mr. Bank robber, Mr. Terrorist, Mr. Drug Dealer, your Second Amendment claim uh, is, is not that powerful, however, uh, an as-applied challenge with more sympathetic facts might yield a different outcome uh, if only one were to be presented on behalf of somebody more deserving who had this type of theory. And so uh, those cases are also notable, and we are, as time goes on, going to get uh, perhaps more balance into the system with, with better cases, and you know, we're working on that. Uh, in any event, uh, let's, let's take a look at some of the, the positive cases that have been meaningful. Uh, uh, in the interest of time, I'll speak about uh, the two primary ones that I litigated, which I think have, 
have, um, have uh, really made a difference and will continue to do so for some time to come. And the first case we turn to uh, is Ezell versus City of Chicago. The City of Chicago is an interesting place, and with all due respect to the DC City Council, I think Chicago has outdone you in its hostility to the Second Amendment. <laughs> They're far more creative and vicious and, uh, and take a very interesting approach to things. In the wake of the McDonald uh, decision striking down Chicago's ban on handguns, Chicago crafted a very uh, Byzantine uh, gun regulation uh, ordinance, one aspect of which required individuals to obtain training on a regular basis to maintain firearms ownership, but then the training was made illegal uh, because it's dangerous to shoot guns. Now, uh, when we approached this case, we didn't, it was not our objective to say that uh, training could never be required. I think everyone agrees that if someone uh, is going to own a firearm, they should probably know how to use it. And uh, as the police in Chicago have, have uh, admitted, training is a perishable skill. If you have a gun, you should probably make it your business. Whether you're required to or not is a different question, but it's, it's, it's a good idea to know how to shoot that gun and learn how to be effective in it so you're more danger to the bad guy than you are to yourself or, or uh, innocent uh, uh, people. But nonetheless, people do, of course, have the right to, to buy guns. And uh, even if they're not, if you, even if they were not required to train with a gun, they do have the right to use the gun, to actually go somewhere and practice shooting it, to engage in the shooting sports and otherwise develop and maintain their skills. And so however else one might regulate gun ranges, and of course gun ranges can be regulated just like any other uh, business use uh, of land might be, nonetheless, you can't ban them entirely. And so we filed and prevailed eventually in the Seventh Circuit in a case called Ezell versus City of Chicago, where Chicago's total ban on gun ranges uh, was struck down. The city responded by enacting a whole host of very interesting regulations, which we're still litigating over, uh, and uh, we'll see how that case proceeds. Another case also uh, out of the state of Illinois, although not Chicago, of course, is Moore versus Madigan, which uh, was mentioned earlier. In here, we were dealing with the fact that Illinois was the only state in the nation that had a total blanket prohibition on the carrying of guns outside the home uh, uh, for defensive purposes. Uh, all 49 other states uh, have some sort of law dealing with this, uh, I guess with the exception of Vermont, which has no law dealing with this. And, um, and, and the laws range uh, in, in their severity, but, but in any event, uh, Illinois was unique in having a complete ban. And our argument there was very simple. Look, the Supreme Court held in Heller that you have the right to keep and bear arms. Bear at the time of the founding meant to carry. There was a, a great deal of, um, there's a great deal of uh, uh, material in Heller and McDonald saying that you have the right to actually carry the gun outside the home. And so you can't have a complete and total uh, uh, prohibition. The, uh, the Seventh Circuit agreed with us, struck down the law, and uh, we're going to see how uh, that case proceeds. It's not yet clear to me whether or not uh, Illinois will petition for a cert. I suspect that it might. Uh, the governor is trying to um, uh, still resist uh, the legislature's reaction to more. Uh, last week, the legislature uh, enacted, uh, by overwhelming majorities in both legislative houses in Illinois, 75% majorities, they enacted a shall issue uh, licensing scheme. The governor suddenly says that, well, he needs a lot more time to think about this because I guess he, you know, he may have tuned it out the last uh, uh, year that this has been going on. So uh, we'll see what happens. Now, the Seventh Circuit, unfortunately, is not like the rest of America. In other courts, we have hostility to the Second Amendment that is off the chart. Um, this is perhaps a telling passage. This is from Richards versus County of Yolo, a case that I handled uh, in, um, uh, in California where uh, the, the judge had this to say about the Second Amendment. I'm quoting here. Compared to many of this country's constitutional protections, the scope of rights under the Second Amendment is ambiguous and no doubt subject to change and evolution over time. Well, uh, respectfully, that's erroneous. Heller and McDonald made clear that the Second Amendment is not a second tier poor relation of the Bill of Rights. It actually does have some substantive meaning the courts are required to discover and then implement one way or the other. But I think the problem here is that many judges simply do not see guns as having any positive social utility. And perhaps that is the problem of the Second Amendment overall. Uh, essentially, we have people in America who have no use for guns, would not have a gun, don't know anyone who would admit to having a gun. And so for such individuals who are unfamiliar and don't much care for firearms, uh, any restriction looks reasonable. There's no law that you could create that they would not say, well, of course, because something might happen, and so this particular law is reasonable no matter how uh, uh, draconian 
and restrictive the burden might well be. And I think this view is also filtered into the courts. Judge uh, Harvey Wilkinson of the Fourth Circuit, I think, crystallized it in an off-quoted passage from U.S. versus Mashandara, and let me quote Judge Wilkinson. Uh, this is serious business. We do not wish to be even minutely responsible for some unspeakably tragic act of mayhem because in the peace of our judicial chamber, we miscalculated as to Second Amendment rights, close quote. Now, what does that say? Uh, the framers secured the right to keep and bear arms because they thought it would be a good idea. Obviously, they were aware that there were some costs inherent uh, in having arms in society, but they believed for, for various reasons that the benefits outweighed the harms, and therefore we have this right enshrined in our Constitution. Nobody ratified the Second Amendment because they thought it would be a bad idea, because they thought it would be harmful. And so if you have a close question, and uh, if it's one with which the court must really wrestle, perhaps uh, if you take seriously the idea that the Second Amendment secures a positive value, then one should err on the side of securing the existence of the right rather than um, rather than uh, uh, saying that uh, if we miscalculate, then uh, something bad uh, might happen. Uh, so we do need to see the Supreme Court probably address uh, that attitude and, and confirm that yes, in fact, there, this is a, a, there's a positive social utility of firearms and to the Second Amendment. Uh, other courts uh, resist the right to arms in, in other ways. Um, uh, several courts have held, they've assumed that you have a right to carry a gun outside the home, for example, but nonetheless have, have upheld the idea that even though you have this right, and even though the Supreme Court has declared this right to be fundamental, you can only exercise this right if the police think it's a good idea for you to do so. And so we've seen courts uphold uh, laws, for example, such as Maryland's that say, oh, you can have a, a, a permit to carry a, a handgun so long as you prove a good and substantial reason to do so, whatever that means. In, in New Jersey, it's justifiable need. In New York, it's proper cause. In California, it's good cause. Now, of course, this would never work for any other constitutional right. Imagine if some state were to pass a law that said, well, you can have an abortion, the Supreme Court precedent on that, but only if it's medically necessary, if somebody else approves of it for you, uh, notwithstanding the fact that you're right. Well, actually, we did have such a case. Uh, we had such a case recently in the Ninth Circuit. Arizona passed a law that said, uh, at 20 weeks of gestational life, a woman cannot choose to have an abortion unless somebody declares that it's medically necessary. Uh, and of course, the Ninth Circuit made very quick work of that in Isaacson v. Horn. They said, look, the Supreme Court, whatever else it said about abortion, has said that you have the right to make that choice for a non-therapeutic abortion up until viability. Viability might be something of a floating target, but still 20 weeks is pre-viability. And if you have the right to have the procedure at that point in time, then certainly it cannot be denied to you uh, unless you prove that it's medically necessary. At that point, it's the physician exercising the choice rather than the patient. And so that law was done away with. Uh, again, uh, applying that same rationale to, to, to firearms, uh, we would see perhaps um, other outcomes. Of course, it's not just uh, these prior restraint type situations that are at issue. In uh, Moore v. Madigan, the Illinois carrying case, we had a very interesting dissent from a denial of rehearing on Bonk. Here's what the dissenters said about how much you could restrict uh, the right to carry a gun. They said, okay, well, all the majority decided here is that you have the right to carry a gun. Illinois can't ban the right uh, to carry a gun. But we also understand, of course, and Heller confirmed, that we can prohibit guns from being carried in so-called sensitive places. And the Supreme Court hasn't given us a lot of guidance as to how we discover where those sensitive places might be. But here is how the four dissenters on the uh, Seventh Circuit saw sensitive places. Areas around schools, courthouses, other government buildings, public universities, public libraries, hospitals, medical offices, public parks and forests, churches and other places of worship, banks, shopping centers, public transportation facilities and vehicles, and venues for sporting events, concerts, and other entertainment, among many possible examples. So areas around forests and everything else, among other possible examples, are all going to be sensitive. Uh, but of course, uh, in this case, at least the dissenters were not outdone by the city's lawyers here in Washington, D.C. They've been arguing in Palmer v. D.C. that all of Washington, D.C. is a sensitive place because very important people live here and we wouldn't want anything bad to happen to them. Um, so again, this is not taking the right very seriously and hopefully we will uh, uh, see the court respond to, uh, to this kind of resistance as well. I should also mention, I know I'm out of time, uh, but, uh, but I'll be remiss in not mentioning that of course the other 
way that courts, hostile courts sometimes deal with the Second Amendment is notwithstanding Heller's language that, that, uh, that the Second Amendment is like other uh, parts of the Bill of Rights not subject to a presumption of constitutionality when it's going to be infringed, uh, courts are applying rational basis uh, to uphold uh, restrictions on the right to keep and bear arms. Now, they don't call it rational basis because everyone knows that uh, Heller said not, not to do that. Well, we're not supposed to apply rational basis, so let's not call it that. We'll call it intermediate scrutiny. But nonetheless, the test that's being applied in many of these cases is not intermediate scrutiny. Intermediate scrutiny requires the government to still carry the burden of proving that there's a reasonable fit between its restriction and the right at issue. But we are seeing case after case after case where courts are saying, oh, the plaintiffs have not overcome their burden to disprove the presumption in favor of this legislative judgment. After all, the government has offered some hypothetical reason why guns would be bad under these circumstances, and therefore the law uh, should be upheld, uh, and uh, any excuse appears is going to be accepted. Now, there's no way to reconcile that with uh, Heller and McDonald or with other cases that correctly read and follow the Supreme Court precedent, and I suspect it's only a matter of time, probably not too long, that the Supreme Court will take some of these cases and start clarifying this area. The one thing I think that we can all agree on is it's very unlikely the Supreme Court would have taken us down this road in Heller and McDonald if they were going to then do nothing else after those cases and simply uh, uh, disappear. I think that the Supreme Court uh, meant to actually start a real field of constitutional law, and it should be getting involved sooner uh, probably rather than later. Thanks.